something I think we did really well is we didn't spend any money on marketing for several years. Um, and I see a lot of young entrepreneurs spending like their entire like all of their money, <laughs> startup costs on marketing. And there's a lot of things you can do yourself. Welcome to Empowerista, a show dedicated to helping you show up and be seen as an entrepreneur. I'm your host, Alex Worley, the CEO of Empowerista, an award-winning producer and national TV host, seen on platforms like entrepreneur.com, Amazon Prime, and Business Rockstars. These are the tips and truths to amplify your influence and income. My guest today is Christina Stemble, the founder and CEO of Farm Girl Flowers. She launched Farm Girl Flowers, an online flower delivery company from her tiny San Francisco apartment. Over the past nine years, she has bootstrapped the company to over 150 team members with an annual revenue of over $30 million. During our chat, Christina shares how she almost ran out of money during her first two years of business, how cash flow is still a struggle today due to large expenses, her grassroots and lean marketing strategy, and how her customers have expressed loving the company's transparency even more than their beautiful signature aesthetic. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Alex. Yes, okay. love having these gorgeous <laughs> flowers in between us. And there's just, I can already tell, there's just a lot of color to your brand. So I'm excited to dissect it. <laughs> Wonderful, yes. And uh, flowers photograph really well and make me look better. So. <laughs> Great thing. Yeah, Everybody, <laughs> right? <laughs> totally. Like, if only we could just have this yes. for every single Instagram photo, we'd yep. be set. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's go back to the beginning. What was Great. the inspiration behind starting Farm Girl Flowers? Yes, the inspiration was actually solving a real problem I had. Um, I should state, I think, as a female entrepreneur, or we like to say an entrepreneur who happens to be female, because yeah. nobody says oh, male entrepreneur, that. right? Good. Yeah. Um, I knew I wanted to start a business. So this wasn't a story that a lot of people want to hear about how, like, I grew up playing in my grandmother's garden. You know, I turned my passion into a business. Um, I think one of the reasons why we're able to be successful is because. I like flowers a lot. I like that we get to bring joy and love to people's lives, but I wanted to start a business that could grow big. And flowers was the area that I found a gap in the industry. I found, uh, you know, like a, um, a space that we could fill. Um, when I was researching the flower space, what led me to start researching was when I would send my mom flowers in Indiana where I grew up, uh, there isn't a florist for at least 25 miles around. And so I would need to use the traditional e-com flower companies that you think of when you want to send flowers to someone that doesn't live near you. And I was really just not happy with the whole, the whole process. I would spend an hour looking through 200 options to find the least ugly option, which you shouldn't have to say about flowers, right? Like I found the least ugly option. I would find like an all white bouquet. And then I would, you know, think it was going to cost 40 or $50. It would cost like $80 by the time I would check out with all the hidden fees. And then what was delivered to her never looked anything like what I thought it was going to. Mm. And so I just didn't like the whole process. And that led me because I wanted to start a business and I was, you know, had like 40 or 50 different ideas going every month, um, led me to start, you know, going down that rabbit hole of research on why flowers cost so much, why they didn't look like what they were supposed to. The whole WYSIWYG was a real thing. Um, and Wizzy found, week? I yeah. haven't heard that oh, sorry. before. <laughs> what you see is what you get. Oh, <laughs> yeah. so, okay. Yeah, what I'm you see wasn't what you got. Yeah. Got so, it. Um, original, like, hashtags, you know, like, people, like, flower fail was a big thing that people were, were you know, noticing. Yeah. And also, uh, you know, consumers started to have cell phones, smartphones, more and more consumers. So even my mom could send me pictures then of what the flowers actually looked like, which years before that, you couldn't. Yeah, you just trust it. Yes. That it's good. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. So if you're in the gifting space like we are with flowers, you know, the, the consumer and the recipient are, very, are different people. And so now there's just a transparency with people being more connected in general. And so that was definitely impacting the flower space as well. So um, I just thought, you know, when I looked at what was out there, I didn't find anybody doing it well, in my opinion. It, they weren't doing it well. I couldn't find a company that I wanted to use to send flowers to my mom. And so I thought wow, this is like, seems to be the first undisrupted space, <laughs> especially in Silicon Valley where I live. Um, could I do it better? So I came up with a model um, using In-N-Out Burger as my inspiration. What? Yeah. Tell me the comparison to that. <laughs> yeah. So back in 2010, when I was coming up with this idea and starting Farm Girl, uh, nobody was doing less is more. 
everybody was doing more is more. That's why the minimum uh, number of options on any of those websites that I, that I mentioned was 169. Oh, wow. Yeah, so nobody was doing less is more. But, you know, In-N-Out Burger, it's like a 20-minute wait every time you try to get a burger there. You know, they do what they do, and they do it really well. I didn't know about the secret menu at that time. So it was just like, do you want a single burger, double burger, triple burger, and that's it, mm -hmm. fries and a drink. Um, they weren't trying to be Burger King that says, you know, their tagline is, you know, we make it your way or, you know, whatever, they'll be whatever you want on that Whopper. Um, so I thought, can I take this less is Mormon, you know, like model and take it to flowers? Because the only lever that I could shift in order to provide better, higher quality, more expensive flowers um, that consumers want was to lessen the waste. And so if I could take that 40 percent industry standard waste down to 2 percent, then I could, you know, use garden roses instead of Alstroemeria and things like that. So, um, you know, I thought, I don't know if consumers will, you know, accept this and re receive it well. But I thought, you know, I have $49,000 in my bank account. This is the first uh, business idea that I had that checked all of the boxes that I wanted to check. You know, it could grow big. It did something good in the world. And I could bootstrap it. Um, so let me give it a try. So I quit my job and started Farm Girl in 2010 for my apartment. Wow. And fast forward 10 years later and you guys are doing more than 32 million in revenue. Yes. So I think it's fair to say it is a success. <laughs> yes. It worked. Your idea came into fruition. Yes. And it wasn't without a lot of hiccups <laughs> no. and lessons learned. No. So let's talk about some of those. Yeah. The, the biggest one that stands out to me, at least, mm -hmm. is that you got at one point within your first two years down to, was it $411 <laughs> yeah. in your bank account? Yep. Wow. So yeah. going from 49,000 mm -hmm. to 411, that must have been really scary. Yes. Um, tell me how you got there, first of all. Yeah, um, everything costs a lot of money. You know, um, when I started Farm World, $49,000 seemed like a lot of money to me, uh, but that was also to live on as well for two years. So I gave myself two years or until I ran out of money, and those really coincided very, you know, almost, you know, it was like a year and a half in when I got down to $411. It's just everything cost more money than you think it's going to, you know, launching a website back then. This is before Shopify was in business. So you had to do a custom site and, um, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, business licenses you need to get and the flowers, you know, I remember telling my dad, he still talks to me about this sometimes, that I needed to get 11 orders a day to break even just on the flowers that I was buying just because I needed, you know, 12 different types of flowers. And so I need a bunch of this and a bunch of this. And I so there's a, a lot of overhead. Yeah, in there's your a lot of overhead. Business. It's an actual product. You know, we have a, mm -hmm. and it's perishable. Which one thing that I had no idea about that I encourage people now, and people ask for my biggest <laughs> lesson or advice. Um, I just really encourage people not to start perishable product businesses. It's it's really challenging. I just need to be really honest. I if I knew then what I know now, I probably wouldn't have started Farm Girl Flowers, to be honest. I really love that it's working and that we're, you know, I have 165 pe you know, jobs that I've created and we're doing it really well. We're doing it in a really, you know, uh, that align with our values. We're building a company that aligns with our values. Um, but perishable product is hard. It's more challenging than anything. I think anything that I do after this is going to feel at least 50% easier because yeah. we literally have three days. You yeah, know, it's not to like, have that deadline to yes. have to make the sales. Wow. Yeah, you yeah. can't like it's a, a you know a sweater. If a sweater doesn't sell, I can mark it down and try to sell it for four months later. I have three days to sell those flowers. So if you mess up in, on your projections, and by the way, American consumers especially want you know they order very last minute. So we're always ordering like you know for a holiday especially we're ordering you know a million dollars of flowers before any of the orders are in. Wow. Based on projections. And if we, mi if we miss those projections, we throw away flowers. And that's, you know, we, you can't afford to throw away a quarter of a million dollars of flowers and stay in business very long. A bootstrap company anyway, you can't. So. Yeah, wow. Okay, so going back to those early days, mm -hmm. is there anything that you spent your money on that you felt like wasn't wise? And, and then what was so necessary to spend your money on for our entrepreneurs watching yeah. and listening to help them understand, okay, yes, this is a worthwhile investment versus what's not? Um, I think, so... I, something I didn't spend money on that I wish I would have was legal um, to protect your trademarks. Um, you know, you can, you can fill out trademarks yourself, but if you don't know really what you're doing, they're not going to be 
um, defendable or yeah. effective and people can pick holes in them and you know get around uh, what you did and that's what happened I did a lot of things just by googling it and on like legal zoom myself um, that I, I wish I would have splurged on lawyers you know we came up with um, you know I came up with the idea of wrapping our flowers in burlap wrap and trademarked it but I didn't know about trade dresses back then and then there's always going to be a lot of companies that you know want to start something that looks strikingly similar to yours that's a legal term you're allowed to use um, but you can't if you didn't protect it well, there's nothing you can do. And especially in products and creative spaces, there's not a lot of protection you can get. So if you can protect anything, do it, and it's well worth the money. Um, later on, you'll spend it times 100 in legal fees trying to protect what you have, and we have done that. Um, which So that's something I wish I would have spent money on. Um, something I think we did really well is we didn't spend any money on marketing for several years. Um, and I see a lot of young entrepreneurs spending like their entire, like all of their money, <laughs> startup costs on marketing. And there's a lot of things you can do yourself, but, like just like grassroots that we don't do anymore because agencies, you know, approach us. And so I always, you know, we will probably never use an outside agency for, for any kind of marketing. We do all of it in house still, um, for the first two and a half years, almost three years, we spent very, the only marketing that I spent money on was taking arrangements like this to coffee shops all over the city. And I made little marketing cards myself that were literally like a third of a penny, you know, like 0.3 cents a piece. And I would put them out at each coffee shop and I would go back every week and I would count how many were taken. And if there was like 40 or 50 taken, I would put another one because it cost me $20 at cost in flowers to put that out each week. But if it was like five or 10 were taken, like that's not worth it. Even that would be good, you know, if you're getting 10 people for $20 on digital spend. But you can go, and I did it in like 10 different neighborhoods all over the city. And for almost three years, that was all of our marketing. And we were growing at like 500% a year still. Wow. So. And so this was in the beginning, you're saying this yes. is what you did. And this was the only marketing only you did? Only marketing. Wow. 100%. Yeah. And it, it is a good yeah. reminder that even in this digital era, there are so many ways that yes. you can market outside of the digital landscape yes. and get really direct to a targeted yeah. audience like that. I mean, digital is expensive now. So we also were very lucky. I just will use the word we were lucky, which I usually don't like that word because it's usually just hard work. But when we started digital marketing, it was at a time when the larger companies hadn't transitioned from, you know, the more traditional channels to digital. So we were able to acquire a customer on Facebook for under a dollar in the early days. You can't do that anymore, especially if you're going for a 25 to 54 year old female. Every, you're going to fight Nordstrom. You're going to fight everybody, you know, for that 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 consumer. Mm -hmm. So you're going to spend a lot more than that. So you need to be, especially if you're just starting out, you're not going to be able to outcompete them. People are only going to see your ads at 2 a.m. in the morning because the auctions, you're never going to be able to, to spend enough. So find other ways to spend your money. You know, those $20 bouquets were way better than what I could have put that money into like Facebook or Instagram or, you know, YouTube or any of those channels at that time. Well, for and for a product business, especially that is so beautiful and mm -hmm. aesthetic is yeah. key, being able to get it in front of your potential customer mm -hmm. for them to see it, smell it, you know, touch yes. it. Like there's no replacement no. for that. There's no photo that nope. can even do it justice. No, nope. can't do a smellgram yet on Instagram yeah. or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. So until that day. Yeah. Yeah. So you have successfully grown your business mm -hmm. and you have bootstrapped it. Yes. So that does require spending a lot of your own money. What are the yeah. things? that you spent your money on. It sounds like mm -hmm. not a ton of marketing, uh, maybe personnel. Um, mm -hmm. What did you spend your money on that has allowed you to scale? The number one thing that we spend money on uh, for in growth in that area is shipping, to be honest. So um, in order to grow our company, uh, we have to subsidize our shipping by a lot. So these are like the things you're going to have to think about when you're a you know, young entrepreneur. Like, where am I going to put my money and where do I want to go? Right now, we would be doing so much more profit as a business if we stayed a regional company. But that's not my goal, to be a regional company. You know, we could be a really great company like Seize Candy is an amazing example of this. You know, they're a regional company. Um, you know, they've made the decision not to subsidize their shipping by shipping east of the Mississippi, which cost a lot. You know, um, we subsidized over $2 million last year. So, uh, you know, we charge consumers $25 to ship a box of flowers, and it's our number one complaint. That really costs me almost $40 to some destinations. So each one of those that I ship out, if, especially if it's certain products that fall under a certain price point, I'm actually losing money on every single one that goes out. 
but I'm doing that to grow the company because once we get enough buying power and we can renegotiate our rates over and over again to get it lower, and also once we can open distribution centers closer to the end consumer, then we'll be able to get, you know, at scale, we'll be able to get almost 90% shipped ground instead of air, which will allow us to make money on that part of the business. But in order to get to that, that stage, I need to spend a lot of money subsidizing our shipping. That's a really good yeah. point that it's important to understand where you're going, not mm -hmm. just where you are, because that will influence very different decisions. Yes. You know, if, if your goal right now is just simply profit, yeah. then you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. Absolutely. But your, your goal is to scale into mm -hmm. an even larger company. So I can see why strategically that yes. is the right move. Yeah, it's, it's a decision you have to make. As an entrepreneur, do you want to be a hundred million dollar company or do you want to be a billion dollar company? And we've made the choice to go the billion route. It's what we we want to get to at some point. And so um, we're making the decisions to do it very differently than if we wanted to be a hundred million dollar company. Yeah. yeah, and admittedly, when I hear that, I'm like a hundred million dollars, a billion dollars. I don't know if I know the difference. Yeah. Like they're <laughs> both a lot of money. Yeah. And in some so, cases, you'll make more money at a hundred million dollar company. Like, you know, yeah, so if yeah. that's what you're going for, like really think about that. Sometimes well, our ego gets into play. Right. Too, right. So I guess yeah. what my, my question for mm -hmm. you is, as for, for you, you're very clear on what your mm -hmm. goals, which is an amazing goal. We need more women billionaires. <laughs> do. So, do. so do it, girl. Yeah. But for you, you're clear on that. You're yeah. clear that the billion dollar business is what you want versus the hundred million. Mm -hmm. How did you get to that clarity? Yeah, so I've, I've changed my mind several times through it um, because, you know, I tried to raise capital several times. Um, I've gotten 104 no's now. Uh, we had three offers and 104 no's. The three offers that we received um, were not great offers. They, as a, a female, I have less than a 2% chance of being able to get capital. And I think there's a lot, especially some of my mentors, have given me some advice that as a woman, you just have to take whatever you can get. And I'm, I'm not okay with that. I've decided I'm not going to subscribe to that. I'm not, you know, we're not in the 1950s anymore and we need to make some, some choices that will get us further along than we are. Um, but with the, the times that I've tried to raise capital and have failed miserably at it, you know, I've, I've had to reassess, like, maybe we should just be regional. Maybe we should just be 100 million, you know, and we own all of our company and we can get, you know, 20% net on that. And that's a great number, you know, every year in profit as a company. Maybe we do that and then maybe we do disbursements to our team and we just do it that way. Um, and I had to decide, like, you know, I didn't start a company to be a $100 million company. Like, that wasn't my goal. And if I was going to do that, it wouldn't be in perishability. It wouldn't be doing flowers. Like, if I'm going to really do this, and I'm going to go all the way. I'm going to do everything I can to reach my ultimate goal so I'm not, like, sitting in that rocking chair when I'm old thinking, what if I had just been brave enough to really go for it? And so it really was just a personal um, you like know, a like, conviction that yeah. you want to see how far it can go Absolutely. and you want to really push yourself and your business to yeah. the limit. Yeah, I want to learn. Like, um, you know, I can, I can, not, I don't want to say easily, but it's a very clear path to get to $100 million. You know, we're growing at 50% year over year. It's not that far in the future that we're going to be 100 million bootstrapped anyway. Um, but how much am I going to continue to learn then? You know, like the last position that I was at at Stanford University where I worked before this, I was there seven and a half years, and I would say probably the last like three or four, I wasn't really learning anything, which I don't ever want to be in that position again. But if I'm growing a billion dollar company, at every stage I'm going to be learning something, and I want to make sure I continue that that mm -hmm. path, or I want to like stop and go do something else where I can. That's so, awesome. Yeah. So you guys keep on going, mm -hmm. and I know that you've said even though it sounds like it was the biggest challenge when you were down to that four hundred eleven dollars, mm -hmm. still to this day you just have uh, more expensive things, yeah. and yeah. Um, so you may have more revenue, but you also have more expenses. Yes. So it's always that challenge of, of keeping that bank account full. Yes. What allows you though to keep going? Yeah, I have to say cash flow is the hardest thing. And so Yeah, let's um, talk about that. Give us yeah. some insight into what you've learned. Yeah, yeah. For especially young entrepreneurs watching this, like I wanna just be really honest because nobody told me this. None of the business books that I read, and I read so many, I don't have a college education, so I just like absorb and read everything that I can. And I read so many business books, listen to so many on audio, I may still do. And, you know, people will gloss over how hard it is. And what I heard the most and read the most was the first two years. The first two years are so hard. Once you get the, through the first two years, then it's, like, going to be okay. 
And I, like, never found that to be true. Like, I just kept expecting that there was going to be this giant light at the end of the tunnel at the two-year mark, and then things were going to be easy, and I was going to sleep eight hours a night and not be freaked out about money all the time. And instead, the opposite happened. You know, instead, it was like, okay, now I have 165 people that rely on me, essentially, for their paycheck. That's a huge burden. Um, you know, they can't pay their rent in San Francisco, the most expensive city in the United States, if I can't pay them, right? So, and every bill that used to be like $200 is now $50,000, you know? So the bills get, get larger. Also, you get to a stage as a company where you have to do business differently. So for us, that means, you know, inventory. So we're too big to order off the shelf for many products. So let's say vases. I'll just give an example that's a, a tangible example. So, you know, we can't buy off the shelf 300 vases at a time when we need thousands and thousands of vases. So we need to custom order. But that means we need to have a big deposit up front six months before. So that money is going to be out of working capital for six months before you're actually going to be able to sell those. And that, that's impossible for a bootstrap company because you can't, I mean, so you have to make decisions that are like, okay, well, we can't do vases. We have to like create products that don't come in a vase then. Or, you know, you're making like a lot of concessions that you don't want to make, but you just need to. And you need to know your numbers really well, or you will run out of money so quick. Um, but, yeah, yeah, really understanding yeah. the revenue versus expenses. And, and yes. then you know how much wiggle room you have and yeah. what concessions are necessary. Yeah. And then you build your whole business around that. Like you build your product lines around that. You're sourcing your, you know, like everything then has to change as you grow. And it's sometimes makes you not the company, you know, you're not creating the products you want to create, but you just have to be like, well, that's what I have to do to make sure I have payroll for the next six months before I sell that product, you know? Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's challenging and it gets more and more challenging with growth instead of less, which I think most people assume that with, you know, growth and having, you know, bigger numbers, like, yes, we're billing hundreds of thousands of dollars every day, but our expenses also have grown just as, as, as big and even bigger because and salaries are really expensive absolutely absolutely so everything grows um you know taxes you go in the higher tax brackets there's all kinds of there's just so many things you need more warehouse space you need so much you know and that costs a lot of money so it just your expenses grow it seems like quicker than what your your revenue growth is at times so you have a lot of pressure, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's a lot. There, yeah. there, there's a lot to figure out as an entrepreneur. Absolutely. So that we don't discourage the yeah. entrepreneurs yeah, watching and listening, yeah. give us some insight to, I mean, at the end of the day, you love it. Yes. You keep going. Yes. You're successful. Yes. So what can you tell them to give them some words, words of encouragement of this is how you handle the pressure yeah. and trust that it's all going to work out. Yeah, I probably should also, yeah, I, I feel like I've said all the bad things. No, so. no, 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 no. <laughs> that transparency is so important, and I'm so glad that you shared it because it's important to yeah. understand the big picture, yeah. and now we can balance it out with, yeah. hey, but at the end of the day, yeah. how do you trust and, and make it work? Yeah, so I think... Um, another thing that I see happens a lot, and this is something that at Farm Girl never happens because we don't have the luxury of having, you know, $5 million in the bank to be able to do this. So we never worry about having a perfect product or a perfect thing before we launch it. We just go for it. And so that's the other thing I think for young entrepreneurs, like, the whole lean startup, the best thing from that, and that was a great book um, that taught me a lot, is the minimum viable product. You just need to get something out there. So um, I think how I make it work is by constantly working in a very scrappy way. So my entire, that's like probably, it, we have out of our you know, core values or our you know, culture and values that we have, scrappiness is rated probably number one. So, you know, everything that you work on needs to have an ROI. Like we don't waste time. We don't work on projects that aren't ever going to be launched. We try everything. We don't have, you know, A-B testing on websites to see what customers respond well to. We just launch something and we see if they buy it. And if they don't, then we get rid of it. You Sometimes know? things are overcomplicated. Way yeah. overcomplicated. And so I think like, you know, scrappiness has really, it's probably our secret sauce on what's made Farm Girl successful. And my entire team personifies that attribute. And it, it's really worked for us. And I think that what I found, and, you know, it's a very good economy right now. People talk about how money is easy to get and cheap, which I have not found that to be the case. And it's always men that are saying that to me, which I find hilarious. But, you know, as a woman, especially like 
with a bootstrapped company, I am so fortunate. And I look at like my team all personifying that as well. Like we just, we go for it. And then we try something and we pivot very quickly. We pivot so quickly and we, you know, never will take two years to analyze everything before we go for it. You know, a good example of that is we had to change our entire supply chain in four months from domestic to international. And my team just rallies and we just do it. You know, there's not this like, I can't because of this or I need to check everything out first. And so... There's probably more trial and error. I'm sure yes. mistakes are made. But, All the but time. When, but when that's okay, when there's that yeah. acceptance in your culture, then you yes. figure it out sooner and yeah. ultimately are connected to what your goals are. We appreciate it when people make mistakes because it means they're going for things, you know? Yeah. Um, as, you know, what we don't appreciate is that things are black hole and, and people aren't getting things done. So, um, so I think the best part about what we do is that we get to see, you know, we're never like working at a big corporation with tons of red tape that never, you know, working on a project for two years that never comes to fruition, you know, and so I hope that's exciting for the young entrepreneurs out there because that's why I still love going to work every single day because we're... The thrill of it. The thrill, yeah. We're just working on new things and we're seeing, you know, there's a tangible good that we're putting out there. We see thousands of bouquets that are made every single day in-house. We see projects we're working on that we launch very quickly. Um, and, you know, that's exciting for a lot of people that don't want to work that, you know, corporate job where they don't, where they see the opposite pretty much happen. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about what your customers love about Farm Girl Flowers. Um, I know that aesthetic is part of it, but mm -hmm. then your transparency and your brand is another part. So let's break down the first mm -hmm. part. Uh, was it strategic to come up with a very unique aesthetic? I know that you're into the very whimsical, uh, wild flower type look with the burlap. Tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. So when I was, one of the problems I was trying to solve when I was, you know, sending my mom flowers was, I, at that point, I was a very, I was early 30s, um, you know, late 20s, early 30s. I didn't like the aesthetic that was out there. You know, the whole, like what they would call modern was like 12 white roses lined up in a cube glass vase. I was like, that, I don't know what modern, you know, that's not my modern, you know. Um, and so I didn't find any flower arrangements that looked like me as a consumer. And so I thought, well, let me set up to change that. Let me just create a bouquet that I would want to receive myself. And, you know, I read some floral arranging books. I'm like, I don't like any of these designs. So I literally just played with flowers to come up with an aesthetic that I would want to receive. And that's what I created with this like wild, just pick from the garden look. Um, I'm really proud of the fact that it has kind of influenced an entire, you know, it, it got that wild and whimsical look out to the masses. And so it's kind of inspired a lot of florists that you know, look like it's a lot of people get really upset by that when they see people that, you know, look like their um, inspiration. I actually take it as a huge compliment because totally. I'm like, that's amazing that people liked our style enough to copy it, really. And so, you know, the, you know, also we created, I wanted a way um, when I was thinking about flowers, number one, I was, you know, when I was researching flowers, I was amazed by how much waste there was in the industry and so much plastic, like so much plastic wrap is used in, in the floral industry. And so I wanted a different way to wrap our flowers. So the where the starting point was, I wanted it because it, I wanted it to have less of an impact on, on the earth. You know, I wanted less waste. And I couldn't find anything that was eco-friendly back in 2010, like truly eco-friendly, not just had like 10% less post-consumer waste, things like that. And so when I was researching fabric, because I was like, maybe I'll just wrap it in fabric. The two fabrics that um, biodegrade are hemp and jute. So I thought, okay, well, jute, I come from farm country in Indiana. I was thinking potato sacks, but in California, it turns out there's no potato farmers. So um, coffee sacks were what I found. And so I reached out to some some roasters, and they donated their coffee sacks to us. And so, and that's burlap? The burlap, okay, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, so the burlap coffee sacks. And so I would cut them up and wrap our bouquets in it. And what I found from that was um, it not only was better for the earth, but it also created this, like, great brand, great packaging around it that, like, if somebody saw my flowers across the street, they knew they were farm girl flowers based on the wrap. Yeah. And so it, it started the whole brand early on and it started because I just wanted something that was, was better for the environment than, than plastic wrap. So, yeah. but it was conscious. Um, I, you know, at every step I wanted to create a company that was truly transparent and authentic. Um, I think that's an overused word now, right? But I wanted to, you know, this is, I'm learning as I go. I wanted to share that with, you know, our customers and our customers, what I was just really pleasantly surprised with how devout they were from a very early 
stage and how much they just loved the brand. Like people stop me on the street and tell me how much they love farm real flowers and tell me the exact moment that they received their first farm real flowers and what it meant to them. And they remember what was going on in their life. They remember how they felt. And that's really special. There's not a lot of companies where they get to, you know, really connect with people at that level, which I'm just so grateful. I didn't know this at the time, but I'm grateful that that's what happened for us. And so... Um, you know, as we've gone, it's been intentional and also surprising at how well it's resonated with people. And so our, we just, you know, we do every year, we do a poll of some sort with our customers. And this last year I was so surprised that the number one reason why people buy from us isn't our aesthetic, which it always was before. It's that they like our company. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about your company. I know off air, you were saying that specifically they like that you're so transparent. So give me examples. What have you been transparent about and mm -hmm. how have you been transparent? Meaning, mm -hmm. do you have a newsletter that you share this information through? Give us a little yeah. insight. Yeah. So mainly newsletter. We have a blog called Not Bossy um, that we also put um, longer. I, as you can see, I talk a lot. And so as I write, no, I, I write it. just like I talk. And so... You know, I can't, in our newsletter, we'll put a couple paragraphs, but it will always link to a, a longer, usually six or seven page thing about like why, the why behind things, you know, in Simon Sinek fashion, I like to really tell the why. Like when, for example, with international sourcing, when we had to change our supply chain, we ran out of flowers. Um, we were very wedded to supporting American farmers and we'd received a lot of press around that. And you know, I needed to change that because we just ran out of flowers and cannabis was legalized in California and that changed the entire um, landscape. Yeah, landscape for, for floriculture. So um, I needed to change that, but I knew a lot of people were going to be upset by that, um, especially with American jobs being such a you know hot topic in the media. And so we just write letters and we send it out to our entire, you know, over a million people on our mailing list and social channels and we tell them the why behind it. Mm -hmm. And have been really, really fortunate that for the most part, 99% of the responses that we get back are so positive and people thanking us, um, you know, because not only do they say that we're not trying to pull the wool over their eyes and do something just to save money, um, but they also feel like they're learning something as they go. Like, and they're a part of your story yeah. and a part of your brand. Absolutely. And I know you'll even share, you said that when you were down to the $411, <laughs> like that's something that you openly share. Yeah. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs would be scared to do that yes. because they would probably feel like, oh, they're going to think I'm not credible or official yeah. or whatever. But that's actually a connection point and a re yep. relatability point. Is, is that what you found? Absolutely. Our most opened email last year in 2019 was my New Year's email where everybody was sending out these like, thank you for an amazing year and it's been so great. And my email was literally like, wow, that year sucked. <laughs> like, so glad it's over. <laughs> this is, you know, our goals for this next year and what we're going to do differently. And, you know, we just share it. Like, we made some mistakes. We're going to like, you know, it, it was a hard year and this is, you know, thanks for coming along with us. And, you know, now we're going to make this year even better. And people were so, like, they responded. They're just like, thank you for keeping it real instead of just being like, we're amazing. Look how much we grew, you know, yeah. and stuff like that. You well, know? that's a good lesson because that's what they're mostly getting. Yeah. So they got 12 emails like that Absolutely. from 12 other brands. Yes. So when your brand is yeah. actually honest, they're like, first of all, this stands out because it's different. Yeah. But then yeah. also, yeah. I'm sure that it, it makes you feel something yeah. when, when someone or a brand is vulnerable like yeah. that. And we connect with stories and, and authenticity, even if that's an overused word. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're all kind of sick of seeing the whole Instagram, like the perfect corner of someone's house that's like set up just for photo ready, you know, stuff. And right. like, then really behind the scenes, everything's a big old mess, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's how it is in business too. Like, yeah, I mean, flowers photograph great. And on Instagram, people think that like, we have this like, you know, white subway tile and reclaimed wood, beautiful like thing. And we try to show in stories all the day, every day. Like we're like, look, this place is a mess. Like it looks like like a flower bomb went off in here. You know, like nothing. There's we're in this raw ware warehouse where like we literally used to have pigeons pooping on our head every day. Like, you know, um, this is not like an Instagram, like beautiful moment with like this, you know, super amazing cafe yeah. looking place. This is just a raw warehouse manufacturing facility. We keep it real. And I think that really resonates. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk about that a little mm -hmm. bit. How has your marketing evolved and how have you represented yourself on social media? Because I'm sure there is a time and place to really showcase the beauty yeah. of your bouquets. I mean, yep. they're beautiful. And that's yep. one of the reasons why yeah. people yeah. order them. Yeah. Um, but then there's also a time and place to show like the messier parts. Yes. So, um, 
tell me how you guys approach that. Um, I think that the static posts are a great place to put the beautiful flowers. So like your Instagram feed. Yes, your Instagram feed on this, like, you know, static Facebook and Instagram posts have a beautiful close up vibrant colors of flowers that people like to save and use as their background images and things like that. Then you have stories and stories is where you keep it real. And you're like, this is, you know, like, you know, we're coming up on Valentine's day, um, in a couple of weeks or no week or so. If you tune in to farm real flowers then, or mother's day or what, any holiday like that in the future, um, you're going to see hundreds of people coming in at 9 PM or midnight and working 16 hour shifts, 12 to 16 hour shifts, uh, in a very raw warehouse at like, you know, 40 degree temperature, super cold and, you know, making thousands of bouquets, you know, that day. And you were going to show that because we want people to see like, this is like, number one, this is the team that's putting so much heart into what they do. But number two, this is what a real operation looks like. This is, you know, not the subway tile and reclaimed wood. This is what it really looks like. And so stories are a great place to really show people, let them in behind the scenes so they get to see what's going on. So you've come a long way since just dropping off bouquets at yes. coffee shops. Yes. Are there any other marketing tools, platforms, et cetera, that work really well for you these days? We still spend the majority on Instagram and Facebook. Um, AdWords gets very, very pricey for us, um, so we don't compete much in that arena. Um, YouTube, we need to do more in, but we haven't, just from lack of having enough people to do that, honestly. But that's a, an area that we'd like to do more in. Um, Pinterest is another one that we probably need to do more in, but I'm just sharing like what we do and don't do, but need to do. Um, and then I think the best thing that we do in marketing is do it ourselves. So this like stuns people, but we have one part-time marketing person for a $32 million operation. Wow. Yeah. We have a some people that work on like social photos and things. Um, but for as far as like marketing, like posting the ads and, you know, a lot of my friends that have uh, companies of similar sizes or smaller sizes, they will spend more money on an agency than on actually the spend, their marketing spend. And so my biggest piece of advice is don't work with an agency that you're paying all the money to post those yourself. You can learn how to do it on YouTube very easily Facebook, all of those channels. Facebook also ads have, and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Ag exactly. You know, until uh, the halftime person that we had, I did most of the ads. Um, and it. I mean, you know how to do it. So yeah. if you ever do want to delegate, then you can delegate correctly because yeah. you can very quickly lose money fast. Very quickly, with, very quickly. So that. watch some, I mean, but there's so much available out there on Google and, you know, yeah. just YouTube to learn and just try it. But, you know, when I see people, when I, you know, they're having problems with growth or they're like only growing very small amounts every year. And I'm like, but how much are you spending on marketing? They'll be like, oh, like a hundred thousand dollars a year. I'm like, how are you? Of course you're only growing that much then if you're only spending a hundred thousand. And then when I look at their marketing budget, I'm like, where's all this money going? And it's going to agencies to post. But I'm like, put that half a million towards the spend, not towards the people posting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, like it, the, you're only going to grow if you get in front of people. So marketing works, right? We all know that. And so you need to put the money on the actual spend, not the person posting that ad. So your part-time yeah. marketing employee, they're mm -hmm. spending money doing ads or doing mm -hmm. the organic posting. What, what are their most valuable tactics? Ads, ads okay, are definitely, it, yeah. I mean, even boosting posts. And so, I mean, that's more for top of the funnel. If you really want conversions, you need to spend the money on the ads. Um, but you know, the part-time person we have is, you know, self-taught on marketing as well. We're not, we don't have like a half a million dollar salary being spent. I'd rather put that money on the actual getting in front of people. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, where can people see your beautiful content on social yes. media and order from you? Uh, farmrealflowers.com um, is our website. And then on Facebook, Instagram, all those places where we're posting those ads and <laughs> click on them and buy. Yeah. And, <laughs> see, and see her behind the scenes yes. stories. That Absolutely. sounds like something fun that I want to check out. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming in today. Uh, thanks for having me.